Have you heard the strange tales of the Whistler? I'm the Whistler. Sylvia warned me. She told me about you. Now I know why. She was telling the truth. She knows you, Frank Gerard. She said you were no good. Another Sunday night, and again, CBS presents The Whistler. I, the Whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. And so I tell you tonight the unusual story of the confession. The courthouse walls of a county in an eastern state have echoed for many years the vibrant, persuasive voice of William Marshall. Marshall has defended countless numbers of persons, great and small, who'd become entangled in the meshes of the law, and he has never lost a case. The great criminal lawyer attributes his success to the fact that he has never taken a case in which he was not convinced that the defendant was either innocent or the victim of unfortunate circumstances. At the moment, in the anteroom of Marshall's office, a beautiful young girl and a handsome man of 30 wait for an audience with the attorney. After some 15 minutes of waiting, the girl speaks to the handsome man. Uh, pardon me, but are you in a terrible hurry to see Mr. Marshall? Why, no. No, that is, my business can wait a few moments. Well, I'd appreciate it so much if I could see him first. I'll only be a few minutes. I, I just got off the train and I've got to see him. I see. Is it really as bad as all that? What? You sound as though you're in terrible trouble. Oh, I am. I really am. Oh, that's too bad. How did it happen? How did what happen? How'd you get into such trouble? I just, well, I've spent all my money. I'm broke. <laughs> oh, is that your trouble? Yes. What did you think? Oh, I thought maybe you'd murdered your husband. Oh, oh, no, I haven't a husband. I've never been married. No. Well, uh, my name is Frank Gerard. Yes. My name is Jean Marshall. William Marshall is my father. I've been away at school for a year, and you know what can happen to a girl's finances in a year. So I've either got to borrow some money from father or borrow his car to get home. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do is you care to wait a few minutes. That is, after I get to see your father, I'll take you right to your door. Well, I, I suppose it's all right. Are you a client of father's, Mr. I Tom? certainly hope to be. He's a busy man, but I hope he can find time to handle my business. All right. I live in Mission Hills. That's not far. I have nothing to do. I'd love to accommodate you. Then I won't be with father over one minute. Your father will be right out, Miss Marshall. Jean, darling, I'm very glad you're home. But what are you doing at the office? I'm broke, father. All right, here you are. <laughs> money, money, money. Sorry, darling. I wish I could talk to you a while now, but I've got to be in court in 20 minutes. See you at dinner. Uh, this gentleman is waiting to see you. Mr. Gerard. Oh, I see. Gerard? Uh, well, come in, Mr. Gerard. See you at dinner, Jean. Yes, Father. Bye. Come along, Gerard. Gerard, Gerard. Hmm. Sit down. Seems to me I've seen you before, Gerard. Have you, Mr. Marshall? Where? Gerard, Gerard. Wait a minute. I know now. You're Frank Gerard. That's right. Frank Gerard. What do you want? I want you to handle a case for me. What sort of a case? A murder case. Murder? Who did you kill, Gerard? Now, wait a minute. First, I want to know if you're going to handle the case. That depends. Who did you kill and what were the circumstances? And remember, I want the truth. I've got to know everything. All right. I killed Joe Barkowitz. Joe Barkowitz? So, that's what happened to Joe. Yeah. And the police are hot on the trail. And sooner than you imagine, they're going to trace it to me. In fact, they're on my trail now. The evidence is going to be so strong against me because we were enemies that, well, I'm going to have a tough job convincing a jury. Convincing them of what? That I shot Joe Barkowitz in self-defense. Self-defense? You shot him in self-defense? Certainly. I'm not a killer. Self-defense. Do you expect me to believe that? Why shouldn't you? Gerard, I know all about you. You belong on the shady side of this city. You've pulled several things that have not been traced to you. You've gotten away with them. But I think you're very bad material. Joe Barkowitz was bad material. Too bad you didn't kill each other at the same time. Is that the way you feel about it? I do. And if Joe Barkowitz came to me with the same story, I'd tell him the same thing. 
It wasn't in self-defense. Yeah? I've got a witness. Oh. Mickey Gifford was with me. He saw Joe pull a gun on me. Mickey Gifford? Oh, oh. Why, I wouldn't trust him across the street. He was Joe Barkowitz's right-hand man until you came along. He turned state's evidence so fast that it'd make you dizzy. You really think that, eh? Certainly. I wouldn't touch your case. Why not? Because I think you deliberately murdered Joe Barkowitz. And I've never yet defended a person unless I was convinced he was innocent of malice or forethought. So you don't think I killed Joe in self-defense? No. I know you. I know all about you. Okay, Marshal, I'll find somebody else. Then find them. I'm not interested. You're making a big mistake, Marshal. A big mistake. I'm a busy man, Gerard. Good day. Okay, Marshal. Okay. Oh, Miss Marshall, I, uh, I was longer than I thought I'd be. Huh? That's all right, Mr. Gerard. Where, where did you say you live? Oh, yes, yes, Mission Hills. Are you ready now? I certainly am. I've got some bags downstairs. Can you handle them? I'd be delighted, Miss Marshall. Come along. This is awfully sweet of you. How can I thank you? Oh, you don't have to thank me, Miss Marshall. It's a pleasure. A great pleasure. A week later, Jean Marshall has fallen deeply in love with Frank Gerard. She's seen Frank night after night. Now, two weeks later, she has begun to stay out rather late. Too late, in fact, to please her beautiful stepmother, Sylvia, who has mentioned the matter to Mr. Marshall. Jean, dear, you've been getting in rather late quite a few nights in succession, haven't you? Well, yes. Lots of parties this summer, Father. They seem to break up unusually late. Sylvia says you came in around three this morning. Oh, were you awake when I came in, Sylvia? Yes, I've been troubled with insomnia lately. Insomnia at your age? Well, you should do something about that, Sylvia. Who escorts you to these parties, Jean? Why do you always leave here alone? Oh, that's the way everyone's doing these days. Why? Gas rationing. The girl meets her escort halfway, parks her car, and continues on in his. I see. Well, I'd prefer that you try to get in a little earlier. I didn't know you were staying out so late until Sylvia told me. Is that why Sylvia has insomnia? Yes, Jean. You never say where you're going or who you're going with. It naturally worries me. Where were you last night? Well, I, I went to a party given by Jack Hyatt. You know the Hyatt. Oh, of course. But I'm sure you understand what Sylvia and I mean. Oh, I'm not a kid anymore. Well, I've got to run along now. See you at dinner, Sylvia. Why didn't you tell your father the truth, Jean? I told him everything he wanted to know. You weren't at a party given by Jack Hyatt last night because Jack Hyatt has been at Pensacola Naval Station for four weeks. He's on leave. I talked to his mother yesterday. She'd have told me if he were home. You're meeting the same man every night. Someone you don't want us to know about. Oh, it has nothing to do with gas rationing. Either he doesn't want to come here or you don't want him to come. You're not my mother, Sylvia. And you're not so many years older than I am, so why don't you quit trying to mother me? Are you in love with this man? Yes, I am. Terribly in love. I've never met anyone like him. He's young, handsome, and charming, and I'll marry him the minute he asks me. Does that answer your question? Why don't you bring him to the house? Because he and Father had some business disagreements, and Father doesn't care for him. But whether Father likes him or not, well, that has nothing to do with me. Who is he? His name is Frank Gerard. Frank Gerard? You mean... Well, what's wrong with him? You... Oh, you can't mean it. Well, what are you so shocked about? Do you know him? No, that is not personally. Oh, but he isn't your type. He, he's a gambler, a gangster. Oh, that's ridiculous. He belongs to the lowest element in town, the, the underworld. Oh, no wonder he doesn't want to come here. He's not in love with you. He's stringing you. He isn't the marrying kind. Oh, please, Jean, don't see him anymore. Oh, if your father knew this, it would kill him. If we're talking about the same man, father is entirely wrong. Father forms opinions about people he knows nothing about from personal experience. Frank is the sweetest man in the world. Oh, please, Jean, don't go through with this. You know nothing about him except what Father has told you? No. Then why don't you stop saying things about people? Things of which you have no personal knowledge. Very well, Jean. I'm terribly sorry for you. I'm sorrier for your father. This will break his heart. Oh, Sylvia, don't be so dramatic. <laughs> Now, several more days have passed, and Jean continues to see Frank Gerard, but never brings him to the house. Sylvia has said nothing about Jean's infatuation to the father for fear of the consequences. 
Then, one day, Frank Gerard has an unexpected visitor at his apartment. Well, hello, Frank. Annette. Well, come in. Haven't seen you around for quite a while. No, I, uh, I've been awfully busy lately. Yeah? What's been keeping you so busy? Oh, one thing or another. I haven't heard from you in over two weeks. You lose my phone number? No. Then why don't you use it? I told you I've been busy. I've been out of town a good deal. I subscribe to the grapevine. You ought to know that I can find out everything I want to. Yeah. Frank, you're making one terrific mistake if you think I'm the kind of a gal who can be kicked into the corner like an old shoe whenever you take a notion. Who's kicking you around? What else would you call it? Now, look, you haven't anything to squawk about, Annette. You've had all the breaks for a couple of years. So, just like that, you decide you've seen me around a little too long. Now, your imagination's running wild. You're just working yourself up into a dither. You said it. And, Frank, when I really get worked up, you'll see a dither that is a dither. You needn't get any louder. I've overlooked an incident or two before because they were mere flashes in the pan. But believe me, this time it's different. You've been listening to a lot of bunk. I know where you've been and what you've been doing since the last time I saw you. So what? I'm a woman, Frank. Oh, not from Vassar or Park Avenue. But when it comes to feelings and emotions, I'm just like any other woman. I don't care who she is. Waited and waited for that moment when we could be married. Married? No other woman will ever love you as I have. You belong to me, Frank. This Marshall girl has no right, no right whatever, do you hear? That's not for you to decide. Oh, you don't love her. You've suddenly gone high hat. You'll only make a sap of yourself. You're just a natural-born troublemaker, Annette. Troublemaker? Yes. If you had any ideas about marriage, you concocted them yourself. I never mentioned the subject. I could kill you. What did you say, Annette? Frank Gerard, if you marry this Marshall girl, if you even see her again, I'll kill you. Kill me? Yes. I think you're bluffing, Annette Laverne. I'll show you. I intend to see Jean Marshall many, many times. And if I should decide to marry her, I will. So long, Frank. I'll be seeing you. Yeah. You better change your face before you get outside. You might scare somebody. And on that very evening, Frank Gerard and Jean Marshall sit in a booth of a quiet roadside inn on the outskirts of town. The old innkeeper, having no other customers, divides his time between serving the food and playing soft music on an old violin. Well, I like it here, Frank. So quiet and secluded. How'd you ever find it? Oh, I don't know. Have you been here before? Once. Some time ago. You know, darling, I... I guess that's why I like you so much. Yeah? Why? Well, you always seem to know the right thing to do at the right time, the right place to go. Do I do? Yes. And we, we seem to get along so well together. We talk about so many things. We understand each other. Yes. Seem to have so much in common. Mutual interest in things and places and people. We've uh, sort of avoided people. Why, why should we want people around us? Nightclubs positively bore me. You, you really love me, don't you, Frank? What do you think? Oh, darling. From the moment you leave me at night until I see you again next day, I, I almost... Well, it, it seems like a thousand years. All day long, I, I worry and worry. What about? That I won't see you that evening. Don't ever worry about that, Jean. Remember that day in Father's office? When we first met? I certainly do. Did, did you feel the same way as I did? I'm sure I did. I knew from that moment that I loved you. That no one else had ever or would ever mean so much. You're such a lovely girl, Jean. Lovely eyes. Red hair. In fact, you're the most beautiful picture I've ever seen in my life. Oh, Frank, darling. I have a wonderful idea. So have I. A terrific idea. Why can't we drive someplace out of town tomorrow? That's and... just what I was going to suggest. We can drive out of town and, and go to someplace up in the mountains. We can swim and fish and boat. Would you like that? And we could stop someplace on the way, some little town. Oh, of course we could. Uh, just as the there peace. are a dozen towns on the way. Oh, Frank, darling, I... I've never been so happy in all my life. I... Oh, oh, 
Oh, wait a minute. What's wrong? Oh, I can't possibly go tomorrow, Jean. I have an important engagement tomorrow. A, a business engagement. It's very important. I've got to keep it. Oh, Frank. We can leave the next morning early. Won't that be all right, dear? Well, I guess it'll have to be all right. Good. And I won't see you until morning after tomorrow because... Well, I'll be tied up all tomorrow evening as well. Oh, darling. I can't help it. I don't like it any more than you do. All right. Guess I can stand it. Tomorrow morning and all day tomorrow and tomorrow night. Well, I guess I can pull through. <laughs> I'll see you at the usual place day after tomorrow. What time? We'd better start early. Say, um, 8 o'clock. I'll be there, darling. The next afternoon, Jean is in her room packing a few outing things. Her father has come home from the office early, so he drops in to see Jean on his way to his room. Hello, Jean. Father, what on earth are you doing home so early? Oh, I don't know. I got a little weary, kind of tired lately, so I thought I'd just quit for the day. The heat was terrific in town. Why don't you give up practicing? Heaven knows you've enough money. Oh, I've thought about it, but I just can't bring myself to quit. I'm afraid I'll fall apart once I admit I'm through with the profession. I should think you'd want to quit and get around a bit and enjoy life. See things. You've done nothing but keep your nose to the wheel. Where in the world can you go these days? Oh, there are plenty of places to go. Right around here. Within a hundred miles of your own door. Mm-hmm. And where are you going? Oh, I'm running up to the mountains with some of the gang. <laughs> Looks like you're packing enough for a week. <laughs> really? Oh, no, just for the weekend. Tell me, in all the parties you've been to this summer, how does it happen you haven't been to the Wilmots? Oh, I don't know. Just didn't happen to fit in, I guess. Parties at several places every night. Fine family, the Wilmots. Fine family. What happened to you and Charlie, Wilmot? You and Charlie used to be great pals before you went away to school. Always like that, boy. Oh, when kids go away to school, things like that just break up. Hasn't broken up with Charlie. I saw him today, and he's still crazy about you, Jean. Is he? Yes, he said he tried and tried to talk to you on the phone, but you were never in. Maybe I wasn't. I'm taking Charlie into my firm as junior partner next week. Oh, he'll make a fine lawyer. Lots of brains, that boy. No, oh, he's such a stick in the mud. You could do far worse. Are you trying to make a match for me? Is that it? Oh, certainly not. I wouldn't want you to marry anyone you didn't love. Oh, good. I'm glad you said that. So why don't you let me select the man? I'm sure I'm capable of finding the one I love. All right, but Charlie's a fine boy. Oh, here you are, William. You're home early. Don't you feel well? Well, you know... Oh, you're awfully pale, dear. You've had another one of those dizzy spells. Yes, doctor said it's just my liver. Take it easy over the weekend. Jean's going up to the mountains for a few days. Mountains? Yes. Well, I think I'll take a nap until dinner. Oh, when did you decide to go to the mountains, Jean? Last night. You're really going to the mountains? Yes, I'm going to the mountains with some of the gang. When? Tomorrow morning at 8, and as usual, you don't believe me. Oh, I think you may be going to the mountains, but not with the gang, as you term it. Then maybe you'd like to come along to make sure. Would you like to be chaperone? Maybe I could arrange it. Please don't go, Jean. Please don't. You'll regret this to the last day of your life. Think so? You're not going with the gang. You're going with him, with Frank Gerard. Yes. And on the way, we're going to be married. Married? Oh, I don't believe that. Well, why should I lie about it? You may think he's going to marry you, but he has no such intentions. It's an old trick. Sylvia, if you don't drop the subject, you'll drive me into hysterics. Very well, Jean. I've warned you. I've done my best. You're going to be a sad, sad girl. <laughs> Afternoon passes and evening comes. Frank Gerard in his apartment lolls and considers the past and the future. Then as he prepares a drink, there is a soft knock at his door. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Gerard. Well, please come in. What can I do for you, Mrs. Marshall? I want to talk to you. Yes? Well, make yourself comfortable. Oh, what a beautiful gown, Mrs. Marshall. Thank you. I haven't seen you for some time. How long has it been? It's been four years, Mr. Gerard. We met last in a nightclub with a group of mutual friends. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. You were captivating that evening. And may I say you're most charming tonight? What a lie. <laughs> I've often wondered if I've ever seen you again. Have you? Well, here I am. And I'm flattered. Highly flattered. And just as conceited as ever. I'm very happy you're here. You won't be when you hear why I came. No? 
Oh, how disappointing. I, I was sure you came just to see me. Me alone. I did come to see you alone. Are you alone? <laughs> well, of course. You're perfectly safe here, Mrs. Marshall. Mrs. Marshall. The Mrs. Marshall of the Blue Book. Sylvia de Levante. Remember the Club Nationale in Detroit? The Folie Nationale starring Sylvia de Levante, direct from London. I can see it now. So can I. What of it? Uh, does your husband know all about that? He does. I doubt it. Maybe he'd be interested to know, huh? I don't scare, Mr. Gerard. And why are you on the defensive? Maybe you know why I'm here. Oh, now, please, please, don't disappoint me. I came here to appeal to your decency, if you have any. Well? Jean Marshall is a fine girl. I want you to leave her alone. I beg your pardon? Her father is the finest man who ever lived. He worships her. Jean is under the impression that you intend to marry her. I know better. If Jean got mixed up with you, it, it would kill her father. Did Jean tell you we were going to be married? Yes, and you've led her to believe that. But you know you've no such intentions, and you're going to the mountains with her in the morning. That's right. But not to get married. Mrs. Marshall, if you were to run along home now and forget all about this and tend to your own business, I might see to it that your husband never knows all about you that might be told. You don't like Jean's father, and he doesn't like you. Why would you want to marry a girl under those conditions? That is none of your business. Maybe I'll make it my business. You do, and I'll guarantee you'll regret it. You'd better run along now. Then you won't listen to me. My appeals to your sense of decency mean nothing. Now, look, I've had... You better get out of here. Go out through the back way and through the other hall. Very well. But please, consider what I say. Yes, yes, I'll consider. Go on. Just a moment. Darling, I had to see you. Why, Jean. I just couldn't stand to be away from you so long. I didn't expect to see you this evening. I knew you said you were going to be busy tonight, but I'll just stay a moment. Oh, Frank, darling, it's been a million years this day. Yes, dear, I missed you terribly, but, well, I didn't expect you and... Uh... I just want to see you for a second, that's all. Are we driving tomorrow or taking the train? We can drive if you like. It's not far. I can take my car. I love to drive the top down, and yours isn't convertible. All right, we'll take your car. All right. I'll go now. Night, darling. Tomorrow's going to be the most wonderful day of my life. But I've said that before so many times. Good night, dear. Ray, dearest, where are my slippers? What? Who is that, Frank? I, I haven't the slightest idea. I... Frank, darling, what on earth has become of my... Sylvia! Why, gee! What are I... you doing here in those pajamas? Oh. How'd you get into that bedroom? What are you doing in my pajamas? Why, I... So you I... didn't know Frank Gerard. Never met him. No wonder you tried to talk me now, out of Jean, marrying. listen to me. And you had a business appointment. Uh, so this is your appointment. This is why you couldn't leave this morning. Jean, she just came here a minute or so ago. You I didn't, didn't expect know... me. I thought you were terribly startled when I walked in. I see it all now. Jean, will you wait? Sylvia warned me. She told me you were no good. Now I know why. She was telling the truth. Sylvia knows you. You desperate rat. Well, Mr. Gerard, maybe that will take the wind out of your sails. I'll just slip into that bedroom. I'll change now, if you don't mind. You think you're very clever, don't you? Well, how'd you like it if I picked up this phone and asked a friend of mine down the hall to step in here? Find you in this condition. What? Well, you wouldn't do that. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Famous attorney's wife found in Frank Gerard's apartment in pajamas. How'd you like that? Wait, don't do that. It won't take a second. Please, don't. Please, I'll go. And you'll keep your mouth shut from now on? Yes, yes, I promise. If I hear one peep out of you, I'll really make trouble. <laughs> Next morning, Sylvia Marshall gets a call to come to the apartment of Frank Gerard. A few moments after her arrival, Attorney Marshall gets a call at his office to come to Gerard's apartment. Now, Sylvia's talking to Captain Brent from headquarters. But why have you called me here, Captain Brent? Frank Gerard was killed last night. His body's in that bedroom. What? And on the floor of the bedroom, we found this locket with your name on it. Pictures of you and your husband. But, but how could that have happened? That's what we wanted to ask you about. How do you think your locket could get here? I, I haven't the slightest idea. Oh, hello, Captain. How are you, Bill? This is my daughter, Jean. Sylvia, what are you doing here? I sent for her, Bill. Frank Gerard was murdered. Murdered? We found your wife's locket on his bedroom floor. I don't like to stir up more trouble than necessary, so I called you. Uh, here's the locket. This is yours, Sylvia. How did it get here? Did you know Gerard? Yes. I knew him. Years ago. What were you doing here? I came here to talk to him. What about? This is Syria, Silver. The truth now. Would you like to tell them, Jean? What does Jean know about it? Go ahead. Tell them, Jean. Very well. 
I came here to talk to Frank Gerard last night because Jean had fallen for him and was going to the mountains with him for the weekend. She thought he was going to marry her, but I knew better. That's how my locket got here. Jean, is this true? Frank Gerard? She's lying. I was here, but I learned she was in love with Frank, and I came here to persuade her to give him up for your sake. She was here when I came in, in the bedroom in pajamas. Sylvia. That's right. I thought I could convince her that he was no good. So when Jean knocked, I slipped into the bedroom instead of out of the back door, put on the pajamas, and stepped into the living room. But I left a few minutes later, and I didn't kill Gerard. Were you in love with this man, Jean? No. I didn't even know him. Jean, how can you say that? I'm sorry to say it, but Mrs. Marshall is in a tough spot, especially with this locket. You didn't know this man, Jean? No. I left here before Sylvia did. So if anybody stabbed him, it must have been Sylvia. I certainly didn't kill him, if that's what you mean. Well, we've got one more suspect coming, I hope. Here she is, Captain. Find her waiting for a train. Oh, yes. Come in, Miss Laverne. Uh, what's all this about? Just want to check on a few things, Annette. When did you see Frank last? I... It's been weeks and weeks. We split up. Why, what's happened? Frank is, uh... Well, he's in that bedroom. He's been murdered. Murdered? Oh, no. You haven't seen him for weeks and weeks, hmm? No, no, I haven't. Turn on that dictaphone machine you found, Sergeant. What did you say, Annette? Frank Gerard, if you marry this Marshall girl, if you even see her again, I'll kill you. Kill me? Yes. Well, I think you're bluffing, Annette Laverne. I'll show you. I intend to see Jean Marshall many, many times. And if I decide to marry her, I will. That, Annette, is your own voice. Gerard recorded that on the dictaphone. You threatened his life, didn't you? Yes, but, but I didn't shoot him. I couldn't have killed him. I love Frank. I... That, Miss Annette Laverne, is the most conclusive evidence I've ever come across. I didn't kill him. I didn't, I tell you. Come along, Annette. Sorry, but there's nothing else I can do. How did you say Gerard was killed? With a paper knife. He was stabbed. Miss Laverne, I'm William Marshall, and I'm going to defend you. I think you did society a good turn. What? If you consent, I'll defend you. And from what I know of this case, I'll practically guarantee that you'll be acquitted. How about it? May I help you? Yes, but... But I'm innocent. You're innocent of any wrong as far as I can see. I think what you did is pardonable. Yes, Mr. Marshall, so far as you can see, Annette did a good deed. Gerard was a blot on society. The evidence is conclusive against her, but you'll get her an acquittal. And why? Because you know she deserves an acquittal. She didn't kill Gerard, but you know who did. Yes, your daughter, Jean. And how do you know? Because Jean was the only person who knew how Gerard was killed. Jean said that if anybody stabbed Frank, it must have been Sylvia. No one had mentioned how he was killed. So if Jean knew he was stabbed, she must have been in the room. But Gerard is out of the way now. He'll be no further trouble to anyone. CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, same time... I, The Whistler, will return to tell you another unusual tale. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.